on primary decomposition, but uh, before we get there, I'd like to say a few words about this question, because when I presented this in Berkeley, uh, there was a lot of confusion among the students what to do. So, so we have a matrix formula, for example, for the dense resultant of three but homogeneous, three homogeneous ternary forms of degree D, okay? Homogeneous ternary forms. Now suppose you're given three equations that are inhomogeneous, three in, in, in homogeneous equations of degree D, and three variables x, y, and z. How can we use this matrix formula that we derived to uh, solve this or get some information. So one question was, for example, how many real roots are there? So we expect maybe d cubed roots by Bezout's theorem, how many real roots are there? Or also another question is sort of what are the, what's the largest, say, a value of a, z value of a real root, okay? So let's concentrate on z. So the first thing that we do is the following. So the first thing we do, we will replace the variable z by a t, just to keep things straight, okay? So I'm going to call z t. So I have an inhomogeneous equations in x, y, and t, and I like to use the resultant formula for homogeneous equations in x, y, and z, okay? Well, now we need to homogenize this. So we want to turn this into a polynomial. So to homogenize this, we're homogenizing x and y. Okay, so we're dividing here by a new variable z. So y z, x over z, y over z. But of course, we want these to be polynomials, so they're general, so we have to multiply by z to the d. Okay? So now at this point, at this point, we have three homogeneous equations in x, y, and z whose coefficients depend on t. Right? So now we're going to fill the resultant matrix. So we have this very nice matrix. What was it? d plus 2. Choose, for example, the Sylvester matrix was a square matrix of, of this size, d plus 2, choose 2, maybe plus 3, I forgot, something like that. So we fill this now. So now we fill this with the polynomials that we get with coefficients. So with polynomials in T, right? So from the point of view of x, y, and z, the coefficients are now polynomials in the variable t. So now every coefficient, we earlier called them cia, they're now polynomials in one variable t. Okay? So now we take the determinant of this matrix. So this will be a polynomial in one variable t, and that polynomial t generates the principal elimination ideal of the given equation. So this is the projection onto the variable that in the beginning was called z, but for clarity we've called t. So this is the uh, projection. So now, for instance, count the real roots. Of this equation, so generically, this will be one to one. So all the roots of the original system will have distinct t coordinates, okay? So we might as well just work with the t. So how do you count real roots? For example, you know, this is all built in. This is now very fast symbolic software. So for example, you can use storm sequences. So if you have a polynomial, so even as d is four, so let's say you have three quartic surfaces in, in three space. So then this will be an equation of degree, what's four times four times four, 64, right? And you can very rapidly, you know, count how many of the 64 roots are real, okay? So the whole point is that you have a matrix formula 
and that working with the polynomial, uh, with the matrix whose entries are polynomials in one variable is very, very fast. Okay? So even if this is a polynomial, you know, suppose this is a Suppose this matrix were a large matrix, so let's say it's a 100 by 100 matrix, you will not be able to evaluate this symbolically. So if you go to Mathematica, a maple, and you say determinant of such a matrix, it will not do it. However, you know, you can quickly get the determinant anyways, you know, you can specialize a bunch of values of t using interpolation, so there's some standard tricks to evaluate a determinant like this. So all of this can be done fast, much faster than applying Grobner bases to, to the original system. Okay, is that clear? So the, the key trick is you start with ho in homogeneous equations and you homogenize, you know, two of the three. Okay, so the rest of the morning uh, I like to talk about primary decomposition, which is the algebraic language for decomposing varieties into irreducible components. We're working in a polynomial ring in n variables and I'm using rational coefficients just to make the point that we have uh, the coefficients in a very simple field that we can do exact arithmetic in. Uh, an ideal prime ideal P is associated to I if there exists a polynomial F, a witness, such that i colon f is equal to p. And we've seen some examples last time. <clears throat> okay, so the radical of i can be defined as follows. <clears throat> is, an, is the intersection of all associated primes of i. So we've seen another definition of the radical, it's the set of all polynomials, some power of which lands in i, but that's equivalent to intersecting all the associated primes, so just in symbols, so the radical of i, is the intersection of all p, where p is associated. We also agreed last time that the set of associated primes is a non-empty finite set. So we can intersect them, and that's equal, I claim, to the definition that you may be a little bit more familiar with, the set of all polynomials, such that some power lands in i. Okay, so for example, let's take the ideal we had last time, so our little running example, AD plus BC, AC, BD, okay, so the radical we saw last time that there are three um, associated primes, there's AB, there was CD, and then there was also A, B, C, D. And you can see that this one really is, contains the other two, so it's not needed for the intersection. So that's a redundant intersection. So really, it suffices to intersect these, and that's A, C, A, D, B, C, B, D. Very easy to do for monomials, okay? So that's the radical, and that's strictly larger in this example, that's strictly larger, I'm sorry, that's strictly larger than i, so this particular i is not a radical ideal, okay? So let's build up uh, a couple techniques for dealing with, uh, you know, radical ideals and associated primes and things like that, okay? So here's a, a useful fact. Proposition 5.3. If you have an ideal and a term order, and if the initial monomial ideal um, with respect to that term order, so I'm picking a term order, I look at the initial monomial ideal, and if this initial monomial ideal is square free, 
So for monomial ideal, to be radical means to be square-free. Square-free means generated by square-free monomials. So monomial is square-free if all the exponents that you see are either 0 or 1. Okay? So if the initial ideal is square-free, and hence radical, then the ideal i is also radical. Okay? So this is a part of a, a wide list, long list of results of the form Suppose you have some ideal. If an initial ideal is nice, then the ideal itself is nice. Okay? So, and nice can mean many things. So in this case, it means <coughs> radical. Okay? Nice can mean, you know, unmixed, cone macaulay. Take any, many, the many, many you know, adjectives in commutative algebra that you can replace for nice. And you always have a theorem that says if the initial ideal is nice, then the original ideal is nice. The converse doesn't hold. Right? You could have a very nice, typically you have a very nice ideal, but the initial ideal can be very ugly. But if the initial ideal is nice, then I is nice. So let's prove, yes? In this proportion, the, in, this is initial ideal for all monomial order. Yes, so if an initial and monomial ideal, so if there exists a term order, so, so I have the indefinite article, if there exists a term order such that the initial monomial ideal is square free, then um, I is also a radical ideal. So let's prove this. I think it's good to uh, see how the argument goes. So it's a sort of standard argument. So, well, by contradiction, okay? So suppose not, okay? So suppose not. So we have some ideal, we have some counterexample that's an ideal I that's not a radical ideal, but some initial ideal is radical. Okay. So suppose we have a counterexample. Well, if there's a counterexample, then there exists a smallest criminal. So that's a lot of how these Gropner basis proofs go. You look for the smallest criminal. So by the smallest criminal, I mean a polynomial, which is not in I, but some power of which, let's say the mth power, is in I. Okay. So that's a, some polynomial that v witnesses the fact that I is not a radical ideal. And by minimal here, I will mean minimal with respect to the term order. Right? So we have chosen here a term order, and I want the f with the property that its leading term is minimal among all such counterexamples. Okay? By Dixon's lemma, that, that will be attained. Okay? So there exists a minimal one. Okay? Well, so let's see what this means. Well, so. Now let's look at the initial monomial of m and raise it to the mth power. Well, it's easy to see that the initial, this is the initial monomial of the mth power. So in general, the initial monomial of a product is the product of the initial monomial. So the initial of the mth power is the mth power of the initial. Um, and so this is in the initial of i, right? Because f to the m is an i. So its initial is an initial ideal, okay? But this one is a radical ideal, right? So since this is a radical ideal, so we have the mth power of something lying in a radical ideal. So we can conclude that n of f is an n of i, okay? So here we're using, you know, here in this step, we're using the fact that the ideal is square free. So we know that the initial of f is in this monomial ideal. But that means there exists some g in i with the property that that monomial is the initial of g. Right? So if somebody is in the initial ideal, right, if some monomial is in the initial ideal, that means there exists a polynomial g in the ideal, it has that initial monomial. Let's call that G. Well, now you do the obvious. Now you replace the small criminal by an even smaller criminal. By F minus G dot dot dot, I'm out of space, right? And you see how the proofs ends, right? So if you look at F minus G, well, F minus G still is not an I, right? Because F is not an i. G is an i. 
So f is congruent to f minus g mod i. So f minus g is not an i, right? Um, but its mth power, you know, some suitable power, will be uh, in in i. Well, in fact, the yeah. So if you look at you know f minus g to the mth power, well, it has f to the m, and every other term contains g, right? So therefore, that's an i, and it's a smaller counterexample. Okay, that's the proof. Okay, so general principle is if the initial ideal is some initial ideal is nice, then the original ideal is nice. And nice can mean anything, right? I mean, there are lots of adjectives. Kozul, Colin Macaulay, whatever, whatever. Yes, question. Yes, so, in the second line of the proof, uh -huh. uh, I don't understand the implications. So the f of m, f to the m has the initial ideal, which is in the initial ideal of i. Yeah. Then so, I thought that maybe the. Yeah, how, how does that. So, this, this implication? Yeah. Okay. So, this thing here, okay, it's some polynomial, it's a monomial, and I know that the mth power of this monomial is in this ideal, okay? But this ideal is a radical ideal. So for monomial ideal, you know, being square free is the same as being radical. So I have that some power of the red thing is in a radical ideal, but well, by definition this means the red thing is in this ideal. So does that mean m is 1? or? No, I can make m1. No, no. A priori m is some integer, right? So 17. So I have the 17th power of something is an, an ideal. That ideal is a radical ideal, then I can replace 17 by 1. That's the definition, that's the second definition of, of radical. Does that make sense? Okay, thanks for asking questions. Um, okay. Okay, so next definition is primary. So you can see here in this course I'm defining the things, sometimes I'm phrasing the definitions a little bit different than in textbooks. Okay? So because I feel from the point of view of nonlinear algebra as a field of applied mathematics, it is more accessible the way I present it here. But that's my opinion. So let me give you a definition. So suppose again I have an ideal I. I'm going to say the ideal is a primary ideal. Ideal is primary if the set of associated primes is a single one. Okay? So we saw earlier the set of appropriated primes is non-empty and it contains at least one element. So the lower bound for the cardinality is 1, and if that lower bound is attained, I'm going to call that ideal a primary ideal. Okay? That's the definition of primary. Well, suppose we have such an ideal, right? then what's the case? Well, if that's so, let's think about it for a moment, the radical is a prime ideal, right? So if P is I is primary, then it's radical, it must be a prime ideal. And S of I has to be that radical. <coughs> Why is that? Well, that follows, unfortunately I erased it, right? So I just had earlier here that the radical is the intersection of all primary ideals. It's of the set of all associated primes. Well, so let's call that associated prime Bob. Okay, so I has an ideal and it has one associated prime and that's Bob. Okay, 
But then intersecting all the associated primes gives Bob. Right? So therefore Bob, by definition, is a radical ideal and is the radical of I. So Bob must be the radical of I. And uh, yeah, and the one extra argument is then that that will be the unique element of the set of associated primes. So if you unravel, you know, the uh, this formula, then that that will be it. Okay, so here is a corollary to all of this. The following are equivalent. for a polynomial ideal. So I given an ideal in a polynomial ring, then the following things are equivalent. So, one, I is a prime ideal. Two, I is a radical ideal. Is, ra is, a rad is radical and primary. And three, the set of associated primes of I is simply the set I. Right? So that's a consequence of this discussion. Right? So if I um, is a prime ideal, then by definition of prime, that says for every polynomial f outside i, p colon f is p. Right? So that says certainly for a prime ideal, that ideal is associated to itself. And it's the only thing that's associated to itself. So prime implies primary. Um, prime also implies radical. So one implies two. But why does two imply one? Well, suppose i is primary. And, you know, it's equal, so then it's equal to its radical, then i is associated to itself, so in particular i is prime. Okay, so one and two are equivalent, and, you know, same with three. Okay, so um, now I'm phrasing this here for a polynomial ring, but of course this works, everything I say here works for arbitrary commutative Noetherian ring. So just to make sure we're on the same page, let's quickly go over this, you know, for the ring of integers, right? So what are the prime ideals, you know, in the ring of integers? Well, every ideal is a principal ideal, and uh, a prime ideal is simply the same thing as a prime number. Okay, so the prime ideals in the ring of integers are exactly the, the prime numbers. The uh, primary ideals They are exactly prime powers. Okay, so an ideal is primary if it's generated by a prime power. Right? So what's the radical? Right? So in, in the ring of integers, the radical of an ideal, so suppose we have uh, the ideal generated by 36, right? Then the radical is generated by 6. Well, the radical of 36 is 6. And that has the primary decomposition, also known as factorization, right? 2 intersected 3. So if, like me, you have the great misfortune to go to an engineering school where the only commutative ring they know about is the ring of integers, well, there's ample of an opportunity to practice, okay? Among integers, we're just talking about primes and prime powers, okay? But of course, here in algebraic geometry, you know, we need other rings. Right? We need polynomial rings and several variables and things like that. So that's where we're going to develop this. <coughs> Maybe we'll, let me keep this example actually. What do we do? We we'll get A, D, plus B, C. Let me use this example one more time. <clears throat> oh. 
Okay, um, here's the theorem. Kind of the big theorem. Okay, so every ideal. So here in the ring of integers, we have a theorem called prime factorization. Right? So it's a theorem about integers that every integer can be factored uniquely up to sign as a product of prime numbers. Okay, so the analog in a uh, Noetherian ring is the primary decomposition. So every ideal i in our polynomial ring is an intersection, is an intersection with an indefinite article, is an intersection of primary ideals. So highlight this in yellow, so the given ideal is an intersection Q1 intersected Q2 intersected QR where the primes that correspond to these ideals, so PI is the radical of QI Right, so being primary means everything on the left board, so in particular it means that the radical is prime, the unique associated prime, that these radicals are distinct and they should be associated. So that's the big theorem about primary decomposition. Okay, so primary decomposition says that every ideal can be, if you have an ideal, it has some finite set of associated primes, maybe R of them, and then I can be written as an intersection of primary ideals, Q1 intersected Q2, blah, 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 QR, and, uh, and the radicals are distinct and they're exactly the R associated primes, and this intersection is irredundant. So if you take any intersectant out, you get something that's strictly larger than I. Okay? Now, the proof is not so difficult. So, this was proved by Amy Noether, actually. So, Amy Noether has an interesting history. So, she was given a, a thesis problem by uh, Paul Gordon, and uh, her problem was to compute the ring of invariance of ternary cortics. We'll get to that later this semester. And she couldn't quite do that. She worked very, very, very hard, and I saw her efforts actually in the Göttingen Library, very impressive. She couldn't quite do it. Very hard computational problem, so she invented modern algebra instead. That was a little <laughs> easier. Okay? It was easier to in invent modern So once we have the language of modern algebra as taught to us by Emmy Noether, this is straightforward, right? With an Noetherian ring, you introduce the concept of irreducible ideals, right, that cannot be written as an intersection of any other one. Then by Noetherianity, every ideal is an intersection of irreducible ideals. Then you group the guys together that have the same radical, for, that they have the same prime for their radical, and voila, you have the primary decomposition. Okay? It's actually easy to prove. Um, hard to compute, okay, but easy to prove. Um, now, question that people often ask, is the primary decomposition unique? Is the primary decomposition unique? Unique. Now, in the ring of integers, it's unique, right? In the ring of integers, every integer can be factored uniquely as a product of prime numbers, so there it's unique. But uh, in general, not quite. Well, the answer is almost but not quite, okay? So let's look at an example. So something is true, but which I will explain. Let's take this ideal, so here's our ideal i, and let's calculate a primary decomposition. I'm gonna give you a primary decomposition. So we know there are so three associated primes, and I claim the following thing is a primary decomposition. So we take a, b, we intersect it with CD, so that gives us the radical, that's a little bit too large, so we have to make it smaller, so we have to intersect with some 
primary ideal that has this associated prime. Okay, I'm going to give you one. Okay, let's. One thing you can do, you can take A, B, C, D, raise it to the mth power. Of course, we have to throw in I, and that will work for any positive integer at least two. Okay, so you can make this as small as you want by raising, you know, this to larger, larger powers. You take the mth power of the maximal ideal A, B, C, D, right? So this is generated by all monomials of degree M. You add an I, right? That's a primary ideal. That's ideal is primary with respect to A, B, C. And you can check, it's a little exercise, that this is a valid identity, so that's not unique, right? So you can use M equals two or three or four. There are infinitely many distinct primary decompositions, okay? Not unique. However, certain aspects of the primary decomposition are unique, and I will explain what these aspects are. Okay. Um, now before we get there, let's note a few things. Let's note that the set of associated primes of the radical is contained in the set of associated primes of I. Okay? So I'm just, you know, it's a proof is not difficult again. So if you have an ideal P that's associated to the radical of I, then it must also be associated to I. Okay? Now there are two ways to, we have two different definitions of what's the radical of an ideal and you can use either of those two definitions to derive this, okay? So if you pass from an ideal to its radical, you get a set of prime ideals that might be small, right? So, so for ankle here, you know, well, if we pass to the radical, then we had prior, we had three associated primes, but now we have only two associated primes. <coughs> We're going to say, P is a minimal prime of I is a minimal prime of I if it's in the left hand side. Otherwise, it's called an embedded prime. Okay, otherwise it's embedded prime. So, uh, so in this example, for this I, these two ideals, they're called minimal primes because they're also associated to the radical. This ideal is associated to I but not to the radical, so we call it an embedded prime of I. Okay? See, this stuff is easy. This stuff is easy. It's much easier than calculus, right? Your engineering friends, you know, they think their students should take calculus and multivariate calculus because that's sort of what freshmen take in college. This stuff is easier, right? Compare this with integration by parts, okay? I assure you that integration by parts is harder than this, okay? This is easy, okay? Please spread the word among your engineering friends and your mechanics friends. Primary decomposition is very easy. It's just unfamiliar because freshmen usually don't see it, okay? So these are the minimal primes and the embedded primes. Um, here's a fact. Let's look at our yellow primary decomposition here. <coughs> Put this in a yellow box. So in our primary decomposition, the primary components <coughs> So this is a little less easy, but it's true, okay? Corresponding to 
So the minimal primes are unique. Namely, okay, I can give you a formula. Okay, so what I'm saying is the following. So here we have the primary ideals that come from the minimal primes. Those QIs are unique. I'm going to give you a formula. Okay, so Michael tells me that P is a minimal prime of I. I'm going to give you a formula for the, the, the definite article, the primary component corresponding to his minimal prime. I'm going to give you a formula in a minute. Okay? On the other hand, you know, for embedded primes, the primary component is not unique. You can always change it. You know. Okay, so what's the formula? Formula is easy. Okay, so the primary component corresponding to a minimal prime is the following thing. You take i colon pi infinity, and then you call an i by that. Okay, now that's qi. Okay. So that's unique. That's it. So if you have p is a minimal prime of i, and you want to know the 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 associated the primary component corresponding to that minimal associated prime, is this is what you do, right? You, you take i colon pi, so that removes everything outside the variety of pi, and then, you know, put the back in, you get that, okay? So we've seen this formula a week ago, eight days ago, in the context of polynomial system solving, right? If i is a zero-dimensional ideal, that is to say, if there are only finitely many standard monomials, we have a zero-dimensional ideal, then this is how you find the multiplicity of a particular zero. That's how you find the you know, structure at a particular point. But this works in general. This works for any ideal i. Okay? Um, I would propose we do a little bit of audience participation now, because I have lots of time and I don't know, you know how familiar people are with this. As I said, this is a bit unfamiliar. So I would say, let's do an example together. So please buckle up, get your computers out. Let's try to do an example for n equals 8. Okay? And maybe you can you know, spread out a little bit. You know, two constants, algebraists are certainly not supposed to sit next to each other, so maybe mix up a little bit. So who has never computed a primary decomposition in their lives? One, two, you guys are familiar? You've done all that? Well, most people do, yeah? Great, so this will be super quick, okay? Then let's do an example. So then we don't have to, okay? So how can, maybe this is the wrong audience for this course, you know? <laughs> it's much too easy for you. So how can the product, so here's a linear algebra question, how can the product of two, two by two matrices be zero? Okay, so. It's a word problem, right? So I like to, my word problem is suppose you have two two by two matrices. How is it possible that two two by two matrices can multiply to zero? Okay, so, well, let's look at these matrices, okay? So here I'm using these variable names, x1, x2, x3. That's good enough for this example, but we can call them something else. It's my first matrix. <coughs> y1, y2, y3 is my second matrix, and these are some quantities, typically non-zero. How on earth is it possible that this product is the zero matrix, right? So what we want is we want the entries of this product. So these are quadratic expressions. So we've played with this a little bit in the uh, triplet setting yesterday, but now we'll just take two two by two matrices, and we're going to be interested in the ideal generated by these entries, okay? So I is an ideal generated by four quadratic polynomials, in fact, bilinear polynomials and eight variables. And uh, so I want you to apply all the adjectives we learned now, right? So what did we learn? So I want you to tell me whether this ideal 
is a prime ideal. I want you to tell me whether this ideal is a primary ideal. I want you to tell me whether this ideal is a radical ideal. I want you to tell me the set of associated primes. I want you to find primary decomposition. So let's take 10 minutes. So either get your laptop out or tablet or sit next to somebody who has their laptop out and find the primary decomposition of this ideal. So how is it possible that the product of two two by two matrices is zero? I'm sorry, I, I thought oh, I overheard you earlier having these ideals in the discussion. So let's see what they are. Three prime ideals. So there's the determinant that was mentioned by Matt. Okay, what do people think? Okay, so we have written this uniquely as the intersection of three prime ideals. The last two, geometrically this is clear, right, if you think about it. So this says the variety, well it breaks into three pieces, right? So one component is if the Y matrix is zero, right? If the Y matrix is zero, then this product is zero. That has four degrees of freedom, right? If the X matrix is zero, the product is also zero, right? So here's another way to think about this. Think about this as rank constraints. So this component says that X has rank zero and Y has allowed to have rank two. Certainly the product, right, the sum of the ranks can be at most two. This one says that Y has rank zero and X is allowed to have rank two. And this component, the most interesting, says that they both have rank one. Okay, so X has rank one, and Y has rank one, and one is in the kernel of the other, okay? Uh, what's the dimension of this variety? Four, five, five. Uh, different opinions. Some people think four, some people think five. So if we have the dimension, here's another way to think about this. The dimension of variety is the maximum dimension of any of its irreducible components, okay? So this component has dimension four. This component has dimension four. This the component has dimension four because every variable in x1, x2, x3, x4 is standard. I always forget to remember the definition. What is the dimension of this irreducible variety? So it's the variety of two matrices having rank one that multiply to zero. That's, what's the dimension of that? So what's the dimension of this? Well, these given equations, they form a Grobner basis, blah, blah, blah. So maybe you compute it? Is it dim? Dim, yes. Yeah, five. five, okay, that's a five dimensional variety. Right? So, so we can go back to our applied friends and we can say that our problem, so a matrix will, product will be zero. There are three possibilities. There's a four dimensional family where one matrix has rank zero and the other has rank two. There's a four dimensional family where one has rank two and the other has rank zero. And there's a five dimensional family where both have rank one, okay? And you can think about this. Now this example, if I give you an example of this, it doesn't mean this is the end of it, okay? This example, since you presented it, this example is the beginning. This example means that you can be inspired to take this example and take it very, very, very far, right? 
Suppose you're interested in syzygies, you might want to say, what is this, right? What is this actually as an ideal, right? These six quadrics, you calculate the syzygies, you see that it's the Egan Northcott complex, you see that it's the two by two minors of a two by four matrix. This is a, an example of what's called a quiver locus, right? This is a quiver variety, right? So in general, you can ask, suppose I have two matrices, how come that their product is zero? Or suppose you have two matrices of size 10, how come their product has rank at most 3? Or suppose you have three matrices, X, Y, and Z, all of size 10. Well, maybe X times Y has rank at most 8, and Y times Z has rank at most 7, and maybe the product of all three of them has rank at most three, right? That's called a quiver variety, a quiver loci. These things are phenomenally important in representation theory. So if you are taking a class in Lie algebras, there's a lot of depth to these examples. So if I show you these examples, this doesn't mean this is the end of it. If you find this interesting, you can take this very far. I have a recent paper in statistics, some luck be published in the Annals of Statistics where these curl varieties play a very big role. Let's take a seven minute break. I'm going to start again at 11.02.